really exciting and really inspiring. I think especially with the climate challenges yeah. and growing urban food insecurity that we're seeing around the world, including Southeast Asia and tropical environment. And the potential of something like this is, is really exciting. Join us as we explore groundbreaking research for achieving net zero urban farming, V plus Agritech and the Sona Energy Research Institute of Singapore. To give a context of why we're here together with, with Sarah, what's going on here and what's, what's ultimately the, the purpose of what you're trying to do with the urban power. Right. Um, so we are working with uh, the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore, uh, CERIS for short, under NUS, um, to actually experiment basically uh, with what you see up there, which is uh, called agri-photovoltaics. Basically, um, the integration of solar with uh, agriculture, right? So why the reason for that is because there are potential co-benefits. Right? What I mean by co benefits is because of climate change. Right, uh, the heat stress, the kind of uh, extreme weather events are actually uh, affecting farmers' crop yield. Right, so crops require protection. Right, so we already see that uh, in many places they are using greenhouses. They're using things like uh, black color shade cloth. Yeah. Right, at the same time uh, for solar deployment. Right, uh, what do solar developers need? They need cheap land. Right, and. There's already like very little uh, amount of cheap land around in places that are highly urbanized, right? So by putting solar together with uh, fresh, uh, growing of uh, agriculture, right, there are co-benefits cool where each one can actually get the benefit from each other. Start with V Plus, um, and if you can just give us a bit more background about what V Plus Agritech is yeah. all about. So V Plus Agritech, we are an innovator and provider of agriculture technology, combining uh, climate tech, right, biotech, as well as digital technology to make farming actually more environmentally sustainable, commercially sustainable, as well as good for health. Yeah. So Ceres is a research institute. So we are called Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore. So it's a national institute which belongs to NUS, National University of Singapore. So what we are doing is the applied solar research. So we cover the, the whole value chain from solar cells that you see the blue squares to solar modules where you put the cells together as well as the PV systems. So what we are looking here is the agrivotas is also an important topic in my research group. So I'm running the urban solar solutions group in Ceres. What we are doing basically in Ceres is more to uh, serve the needs of Singapore as well as the, the region. So in Singapore, we see the important needs of enhance the, the food security, right? SFA have this uh, uh, 30 by 30 initiative to have 30% of the nutritional needs to be sustainably uh, produced in Singapore. Concurrently, so the SG Green Plan also wants to install like two gigawatt peak of solar energy in Singapore by 2030. So both food production, the expansion of uh, food production, as well as the PV deployments need, la need large area of space, yeah. right? Mm. So that's why we, we see that there, there is uh, actually a chance by working on our, our agri vortex, which is agriculture plus PV, so that we can use the same land for dual purpose or even multiple purpose to, to solve the issue of both the food production as well as the energy production. So obviously the solar tech is not the only tech here as well. So James, maybe if you take us through how the, the growing towers work and how the aquaponic system that is mm. behind us, uh, how that all plays a part. So V Plus Agritech is um, both a provider of technology as well as we innovate, right? Yeah. So um, aquaponics is not new. The farming of vegetables together with fish, right, is not new. You, you use uh, the fish waste to turn it into plant nutrients, right? And with that, you actually uh, decouple yourself from the need for chemical fertilizers. And we know that chemical fertilizers, the, the manufacturing of it, as well as the usage of it, actually releases a greenhouse gas known as nitrous oxide, which has uh, 300 times higher global warming potential compared to carbon dioxide. Right? And it's a major contributor of greenhouse gas from the agriculture sector. Right? So by decoupling ourselves from the need for chemical fertilizers, we address uh, uh, these emissions from chemicals, right? The other thing that we want to address is uh, not just sustainability, it's the commercial viability, 
right? With uh, the prices of chemical fertilizers uh, shooting up ever since the Ukraine war happened, right? Farmers are squeezed, right? So again, there, there's another benefit, a commercial benefit from it, right? Um, the other thing is health, right? Yeah. So uh, we want to farm naturally. So um, the previous healthy method, right? I say previous because uh, it's uh, becoming untenable for farmers to farm organic, yeah. right? So the thing is, how else can we farm using natural methods, right? And still have sufficient yield, right? And that is uh, using aquaponics, right? And then how is our aquaponics different from other type, types of implementation of aquaponics is first we implement in the form of a tower, right? Second is we have a research again together with uh, National University of Singapore in the area of uh, nitrifying bacteria or we call them microbes, right? We use that use that interchangeably. So microbes already exist in the aquaponic system naturally, just like how uh, good and bad bacteria exist in our gut, right? So the research is to discover what are the strains of uh, good bacteria that works the best. And then, uh, so we are kind of at the technological readiness level six, uh, PRL six, according to the NASA definition, right? So, um, and we are going to push this experiment further till we can actually commercialize uh, these microbes. So just imagine if you can have microbes in a bottle, something like Yakult drink, and instead of uh, throwing fertilizer pellets into the soil or into the water, or water system, right? You now pour that thing into the soil or water system, and then they will convert whatever waste from uh, animals, livestock, right, or fishes into plant nutrients, right? And that way, uh, you actually save the soil, right? Instead of pouring more chemicals into the soil, the soil conditioning becomes healthier and it's naturally good for growth, right? So that is the other thing. We decouple uh, ourselves, uh, right, from the need for fertilizers and and also we, we are able to plant uh, healthily, right? And uh, within these towers, uh, we have something special going on inside, right? Um, what uh, helps actually bacteria to grow is actually similar to what, what helps human beings to live, right? So bacteria are living things, right? They require air, water, and space, right? So inside, we, we do have some uh, special foam-like material that create enough space for the bacteria to actually grow within the towers itself, right? And when that happens, actually the bacteria, the good bacteria gets attached to the plant roots and also improve the nutrient absorption. So with that, it is possible to actually grow faster, right? So um, growing faster is are important for commercial farmers, right? Because they have a faster turnover of crops and they can sell more, right? So, uh, so this benefits uh, plus together that we can now sell, right? Three things, okay? You have three cash crops. Uh, you can sell fish, you can sell vegetables. And now if you have solar energy to help offset the energy cost of farming, yeah. you can imagine that farming now becomes uh, more profitable and more commercially resilient, right? And today, um, farmers are giving up simply because they only have one cash crop. Yeah. And the moment the weather turns bad, right, that for that season, that's it, right? Yeah, so we, we want to make um, farming more resilient and uh, in a way lucrative so that more people will join the farming industry. So yeah. rather than having the farming industry shrink, we need it to grow. How does this differ from you know, your more traditional growth in soil um, and just how, how does the tower itself actually work? Right. So um, growing in soil, of course, is horizontal, right? So the amount of crops or plants you can grow, let's say per square foot, is much smaller than like this. Per square foot, you already have like almost 90 plants, right? The other thing is that uh, in, in a tower setting, other than having more, right? We actually just now mentioned about the special thing we put inside the towers, yeah. right? Which allow the microbes to grow, right? And um, using a soilless method, just now I ex as I explained, right? You actually uh, have less pests compared to uh, soy-based methods, right? So you can also grow faster, right? And with, by growing faster, having fewer pests and uh, having a higher plant density, Right, you can produce eight times more yield compared to a horizontal traditional soy-based farming methods. Yeah. If you could just explain a bit more about how you got involved in this project and 
and mm. the role of the solar cells that they play um, mm. in this in this whole setup that we're at today. Yeah. So as mentioned, Ceres is working on this agrivortex, which is agriculture plus PV photovortex. So in 2023, the Yuhua CC actually they they launched this Yuhua Living Lab. So it was inaugurated in November 2023 by uh, Minister Grace Gu, the Minister for Sustainability and Environment in Singapore. So this is actually a dynamic dynamic hub for us to look into the combination of solar technology as well as soilless uh, agri-tech technology. So it's a platform that for us to uh, innovate, test bedding, and further optimize like whatever configurations that's ideal for future large deployments in Singapore, like in other rooftops or in the uh, bigger region. Uh, out of the 10 test beds that's in this you are living there. We are taking care of two of the test beds. So within this test bed, we are looking at the um, impacts of uh, solar panel designs, as well as the impacts of different uh, growing setup. We are seeing how different growing uh, setups and how the different solar technologies, as well as how the uh, the crop varieties, like they how do they uh, interact with each, with each other. And where are the uh, possible synergies in future that we can create yeah. scalable innovative solutions that we can uh, deploy in other roofs in Singapore or in the bigger region? Right. I mean, we've got a fairly limited set of solar cells above us. Is that providing sufficient electricity for this? And what kind of other role do they play in this whole setup? Yeah. Okay. So the solar cells, the solar panels that we use for this project, uh, they have uh, two purposes. So first purpose is that it generates electricity, of course, renewable energy. And the second one is it provides the partial shading to the plants, which they will need because most of the plants in Singapore, they can't take the full sunshine condition in Singapore. So the solar panels provides a nice protection for them. It cuts the shading to the, to the plants. And uh, uh, the, pa the panels that you see here uh, are rotatable. So we are designed in a way that it can be rotated to track the sun movement. So by that, you can maximize the solar energy generation. So by rotating the panels, it also serves in uh, other ways, such as we can uh, use it for rainwater protection. And in the future, we also want to do the rainwater collection for irrigation purposes, right? So when we have, let's say, an uh, enclosed greenhouse environment, so the rotatable per panels can also be used to control the microclimate inside the greenhouse. So the, these are the benefits that we see from the rotatable uh, PV panels. But the solar cells we use, they are rather commercial ones. So similar or same to all the panels, all the type of solar cells that you see uh, commercially installed on door. So what is different here is that we have the solar cells spaced out, so leaving certain gaps. So the lights can reach, certain amount of lights can reach to the plants because the plants need lights for photosynthesis, but they, but they can't take too much light or too much heat because uh, yeah, it's just like a human. We also can't stand in the first sun for, for, the, for the whole day. So similar to the plants. So, so that's why we have it spaced out to cast different amount of shading. So what you are seeing here is that we have PV panels. They are consist of like uh, either 10 cells in each panel or 12 cells in each panel. So by that, you actually, there is a variance in terms of amount of shading. Yeah. So in our initial experiments, we already observed that the, the plants, they do have a noticeable difference in their growth behavior due to the variations in the shading of this 10 versus 12 cells. So it's quite interesting. So in terms of the energy generation for this greenhouse, so with the areas that we have here, and also considering the gaps that we have to leave for the lights to reach the, the vegetables, so it's about like uh, 50, 50 to like 60% uh, of uh, transparency. Yeah. So that means the light can, can reach the plants. So with that, we are generating at the moment about 12 kilowatt hour per day. Of course, different weathers, it will result in different value for each day. But overall, it's about 12 kilowatt hours per day, which at the moment we see it's more than sufficient for running this greenhouse. Amazing. It's a massively important role for a kind of semi-controlled outdoor environment. Yes. Yeah. So, so in a way, we are, we are 
using what we can produce as an energy budget. Yeah. And we try to work within that energy budget so that if there's a potential to be net zero. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Which is an amazing outcome. One of the biggest challenges with kind of vertical farming that's often raised is often the massive the amount of electricity usage yes. uh, and the significant cost mm. that typically comes from what is tradition what I say traditionally uh, it's probably not very traditional but mm. in the modern farming context yeah. usually an indoor kind of yes. it's a lot of done indoor very controlled yes um no natural sunlight mm. high electricity usage and a yes. high cost that comes with that right with this experiment how are you looking to kind of address that right i think uh in the last few years before covid happened there's been a lot of interest and uh, growth in indoor farms using artificial lights, right? And then, um, but after COVID and the Ukraine war happened, right, uh, the, the cost of energy has gone up, right? And that actually squeezed these indoor farms into the unprofitable zone, right? And that is why we, we are thinking that there's a new method required and the new method is you go vertical, but you go outdoors, yeah. right? So uh, previously, the thinking about indoor farms, or rather the thinking about vertical farms is always associated with being indoors. So now we implement vertical farming outdoors. Yeah. And we implement what you call a semi-controlled environment agriculture, not 100% controlled environment, yeah. right? So using a greenhouse is a semi-controlled environment, right? Uh, because you have natural light, right? And then like in the case of a tropical... Uh, country like Singapore, right? You you don't need actually a all glass greenhouse, right? Your walls are actually insect netting. So because of that, your implementation cost is lower, right? Of course, your energy cost is far, far lower than indoor farms. I would say seven to eight times even lower, right? And with that, actually, um, you can grow at a unit with UK, unit economics uh, that is that makes sense for vegetables because vegetables are a cheap commodity. Right. You can't spend too much money to grow every kilogram of vegetable. It has to be as low as possible right? so that you can be profitable. And by being profitable, that's where you can scale. Right? There's no point building one farm and then you are not profitable. You can't build your second or third farm. Right? You want something that is commercially viable so that people will come in to invest and then farmers can have a second, third farm. That's where you start to scale sustainable agriculture. After this experiment, where do you hope to see this go? So um, the important thing we are gathering here is data, right? And we need data to actually unlock uh, two things. One is investments. The other thing is adoption by farmers, right? So um, agrivoltic pilot projects uh, have already been done in parts of Europe, um, but it has not been done in Asia. Right. And in a tropical climate around the equator, equatorial region. Right. So, um, but farmers are a very traditional bunch. Right. Yeah. Uh, they are very resistant to change. What works, they'll just stick to it. But we know that um, the future, because of climate change, you can't stick to the usual methods. Right. So, but the thing is, they are resistant because they do not know what will happen if they put their money or they allow a greenhouse to be constructed above where they are farming with agrivoltics, yeah. right? So we need data to convince them that if you are growing, let's say, xiao pai cai, a type of Chinese vegetable or, or lettuces, right? And if you put uh, solar panels or a certain transmittance above it, right? Um, there's not going to be a drop in your crop yield. At the same time, you might experience an improvement. At the same time, you might have energy, right? That can actually offset your costs. We need data to convince them, right? The other uh, stakeholder that I talk about are actually investors, right? So today, investors are putting their money into conventional solar, right? And it, they are not certain whether agri solar, uh, by pairing them together, is going to be a, a, a commercially viable model, right? So with this data, and we hope that you'll be a positive one, right? We can actually convince uh, adoption as well as investments to come in, and that's when we can scale. Right. So what Z Plus uh, is doing is we are actually putting our money where our mouth is, right? So uh, together with uh, Series, we are actually partnering up, right? To actually uh, bid. Actually, we have submitted a tender to to build uh, probably right the the largest uh, agrivoltic farm in uh, Southeast Asia at least, right? And possibly also the first net zero farm. 
at a commercial scale. It's going to be like two hectares, right? So we really hope to win that. So that's going to happen like uh, in the next six months, actually. Yeah, if it does happen, yeah. right? And if we win the bid, right? In two to three years time, you're going to see a commercial slide size this thing, right? And that's why we will have a commercial size kind of data. Uh, and with that data, we can scale to the other parts of the world, right? Ultimately, our ambition uh, or aspiration, right, is actually global because our mission is actually to take climate action, right? It doesn't make sense for us to just build one farm and then that's it, yeah, right? So I think what one, one coin James mentioned is right that agriculture is, uh, is nothing new, like in terms of in the world, but it's usually done in countries like uh, Europe or America. And, but agriculture, since it's agriculture and it's uh, PV, which is uh, solar energy, so both of them are geographically uh, re like, uh, dependent or it's re related to the geographic conditions as well as the climate conditions. So whatever result is produced in other countries, in other climates, or in other uh, geographical locations, doesn't represent the same results in Singapore. So we want to see, like in the local context, because we are an urban as well as a, a tropical environment. So within this unit environment, how does agriculture test works? And even more in the rooftop, not like in, in large lands in some countries, right? Because we see in the future, there will be more uh, outdoor farms, either on the rooftop of the buildings or like this uh, multi-story car parts. So since we see a trend for that, so we want to see what are the uh, optimal configurations that we can develop through this uh, project, the three-year project that is suitable for Singapore in the local context or in the tropical area. Because we, we look at mainly the three things. The basically it's a balance between the crop yield and renewable energy generation and the, renew and the energy consumption. So three of them are important. And when we talk about the uh, crop yield, it's also the crop yield within the unit area, yeah. right? That's why we are also looking at different growth setups to see which one has more crop yield within the unit area. So uh, it's all three factors, they are crossing together. And eventually it also guides whether the financial like calculations, like whether this will work and how economically feasible it is to be deployed in, in other roofs in Singapore. So. This is something that we see this project will have uh, uh, the insights like in terms of uh, how do we optimize the solar panel design? How do I optimize this uh, growth setup, including what are the suitable type of crops that I can grow in this uh, environment? Oh, amazing. Well, no, it's really exciting and really inspiring. I think especially with the climate challenges yeah. and growing urban food insecurity that we're seeing around the world, including Southeast Asia and tropical environments. And the potential of something like this is, is really exciting. So hopefully your two hectare plot is a success and, and beyond from there. But thank you both so much. Really appreciate yeah. it.